So tonight what we're going to discuss is we are going to discuss kind of how we can actually accurately measure GDP as it pertains to determining changes in economic growth over time. We can also use GDP as a way to estimate the inflation rate. Now, when we talk about inflation later on in its own kind of unique lecture, we'll actually use a different uh, measurement for inflation known as the consumer price index, more so because of the fact that that one is geared towards seeing how prices change and things that you would typically buy compared to GDP where it's going to include every single thing. So like things that you might not be interested in buying or you wouldn't normally buy might be overstating the level of inflation in the overall economy because they aren't necessarily impacting you as significantly as they might be impacting a business or a manufacturer of some sort. So real GDP is going to be our way of measuring things, adjusting for inflation so we can truly see how much the economy is improving or shrinking over time versus just what's known as nominal GDP, where we're just kind of taking the number and the definition that I gave you in our last lecture. So just a roadmap of what we're gonna talk about in this lecture is um, we're gonna define what inflation is and why we would need this difference between real and nominal variables. We will identify what a base year is. So a base year is kind of the normalizing point that allows for us to kind of benchmark and map specific goods to a specific price so we can see kind of how much productivity is improved overall over time instead of just seeing how much more productivity, but also that is mixed in with how much more things cost, which would potentially kind of confuse or conflate or muddle, muddy the waters in terms of being able to um, conclude what's happened to GDP between one year and another year. So we'll calculate those with um, a formula We'll then calculate what's known as the GDP deflator, which is an inflation uh, measurement. Uh, it's an example of what's known as a price level. And then we'll be able to calculate that and calculate the inflation rate. So the last lecture was focusing on what macroeconomics is, what measurements we use for determining macroeconomic performance, particularly as it pertains to GDP, gross domestic product, talked about the definition of it, all of the components of it, consumption, investment, government spending, net exports. And then now what we're doing is we're converting it to something that's actually usable from a quantitative standpoint. So we can make some sort of interpretation about the status of the economy as it pertains to changes over time. But before I do that, I wanted to just kind of make a couple of scenarios that kind of key into what we talked about on um, our last lecture. So, um, so that way you can get a better understanding of what the expectations are when you're given a scenario and you're responsible for interpreting what the actual value of GDP is. So an example that I'll give is, let's say you have, um, you have a car being produced. So we're building a new Tesla in 2021. Okay, it costs, to, uh, let's say $15,000 to produce it. And we end up selling it in 2021 for 40,000. So the contribution in this scenario for GDP in 2021 is going to be $40,000. The reason for that is the value of the car is $40,000. The value of the cost of the car is 15,000. Now, the thing is, is that you might be tempted to say 55,000 or 15,000, but because we produced it in 2021, we sold it in 2021, 
that means that the value of these goods and services that were used to produce the Tesla are now not counting because they are factored into the final price of the vehicle. These are now known as intermediate goods. And intermediate goods do not count towards GDP. So it would be different if you sold it in 2022 as opposed to 2021, right? Absolutely. So it would be the $15,000. Exactly. So if I rewrite the problem up. Sorry. Um, oh, no, you're fine. I just erased it too quickly because I wrote a bunch of stuff and I wanted to erase stuff, but I figured it was easier to just rewrite it. Um, so what ends up happening is... Uh, it's sold in 2022 for 40,000. Then you'd be correct that this would count as inventories in our 2021 GDP as $15,000 because once the year is ended and it hasn't been sold, it just counts in inventories as our. Um, counts and inventories as our value of GDP because the marketing sales of it doesn't matter anymore. Just like with the house example in our previous lecture, where if you, if the house appreciates in value because it's just sitting on valuable land, well, there was no production added to it, it just became more valuable. So that doesn't really need or warrant being uh, measured or estimated in our value of um, GDP because it's not measuring production. So the car sells in 2022 for $40,000, but that $40,000 wouldn't go towards any GDP, right? Absolutely right. So 2022 GDP's contribution is zero. Because it was produced and claimed as inventory in 2021. Exactly. Okay. Yep. I guess, okay. Thank you. No problem. I appreciate that you're walking through the problem because um, these are the little tricky nuances with GDP. So like naturally you can make the argument that it is still, it's still worth, the car's still worth 40 grand, but in terms of the actual contributions to the economy, that 40,000 has nothing to do with the economy in 2021 because the, the the money didn't change hands in 2021. We weren't able to assess value. It was just kind of claimed as inventories at the end of the year by whoever Tesla, whoever made the vehicle. Again, because when you claim inventories or your or your listing or to keep making an account of your inventories, you basically value it at the cost of production. But that doesn't mean you're going to sell it for more than how much you pay for it. In fact, you could sell it at a liquidation for almost nothing. So, um, but in terms of accounting where the money you spent went, it's good to make sure that you're valuing it at how much you cost because someone was hired. So that money that you paid that person to make that product, even if you sell it for nothing, ends up circulating through the economy and allowing for other goods and services to be produced or purchased by the household uh, that was hired to do your job in terms of manufacturing your vehicle. Um, the example that I gave, not sure if I gave this example uh, last lecture or not, but I'll, I'll give it again, is that um, I bought a house in 2020. Kind of funny it says bought house and i just keep looking at it as if i made a typo and then if you just make that a v then it's my house the vote house so but i bought a house in that's why everyone knows not know how to pronounce my last names because they see this and they're like oh well if you just change the v to the v that's how you pronounce it but it's vote like you're voting for me to to be your senator or congressperson or dog catcher or whatever, but um, so I bought a house in 2020. Uh, I paid an amount for it. I'll just say I paid 200,000 for it. 
I might have paid less, I might have paid more, but just for the sake of example, I'll say I paid 200. And I spent $15,000 on renovations. But did I sell the house in 2020? No, I didn't sell the house in 2020. I'm still living in the house um, for now. And so 2020 has came and went. And so what is the contribution to 2020's GDP? 15,000, right? Exactly. For the renovations? Okay. Yep, just 15,000 for the renovations. So the appreciated value of the home, uh, I can attest to the fact that nothing was done to this house to improve it between the time they listed it in 2020 and the time I bought it. In fact, that's why I spent $15,000 in renovations was because a lot of the things were original to when the house was built in 1992. So it was, I took it on myself to modernize it. So I spent $15,000 to renovate it, but I didn't sell the house. Um, so the only contribution to 2020 GDP is 15,000. Now, let's say that I end up selling the house for 50,000 more. So I sell it for 250,000 in 2021. What is the contribution to 2021 GDP? The 50,000. Uh, you got. Oh tricked. no, there's zero comp. Yes, there's... you got tricked. That's why I did Dang it this it. way. Everyone gets tricked, and I'm sorry for being so uh tedious about this. But yes, the answer is zero because I sold it in 21. Now, if I had sold it in 20, then the answer would have been 50,000 for 20. The 15,000 in renovations would become an intermediate good, just like the car example. And then the value added would be the contribution of GDP. But because I sold the house for 50,000 extra in 21. It uh, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because the production was in 2020. So, oh, okay. so if could, you made more renovations for another $15,000 this year and sold the house this year, it would be 15,000 this year. But uh, uh, the extra cost the, wouldn't. So it would be 50. I think you said 15. I think you meant 50. Like if I, if it went, if I sold it for 250 and I spent another 15,000 on it this year, then yes, it would. It would been. be the 50,000. Right. The 50,000 if it's sold okay. in the same year. Okay. I understand now. Thank nope. Uh, appreciate the question. So, um, but yeah. I have so another question. Go ahead. Um, it's going back to the Tesla one. So if you were to sell it in 2021 at a lower cost than the production, what would the contribution be to GDP? It would still be whatever the cost of production was. So the so the reality is is that um, we basically chalk it up to market forces after that. Basically, the contribution to the economy was how much you spent on it. Now, if you spent a million dollars producing a product that nobody ends up wanting, you've contributed a million dollars to the economy by basically buying up the materials and paying people to work for you and stuff like that. Now, if it turns out that the sum, you end up selling that million dollars worth of inventory for 50,000, um, it doesn't have any bearing in terms of the actual measurement of GDP, but it will probably destroy your business because you lost $950,000. So that can have a long-term impact on the economy because if you overproduce and you don't sell it, well, then what are you going to do next period? You're going to sell less and that's going to put a have a negative impact on GDP in a subsequent year. So it's important for you to not only make stuff, but you also have to make stuff that actually that people actually want or else the market will kind of destroy you in terms of not buying anything. So 
Um, you can see the supply and demand forces that we talked about before can play a role in terms of how inventory may impact the long-term GDP potential. And we talk about aggregate expenditures towards the end of the semester, at, I wanna say two or three, four lectures ahead of this one or after this one. That's something that we'll talk about uh, in quite a bit of detail. So what I don't understand now that she asked that question is, so you build the Tesla, it costs $15,000 to produce mm -hmm. in 2021. If you sell it in 2021 for $40,000, the GDP contribution would be $40,000 right. as opposed to the 15,000. Right. But if it costs $15,000 to produce and you only sell it for $10,000, wouldn't the GDP contribution be ten thousand dollars it would be 15 at mint it, it can't be anything less more th or less than what it costs you to produce it okay so anything that it costs above production would be the the gdp contribution but right because there's value than... added so like value added so okay. the term the whole is greater than the sum of the parts so like the whole reason why you go into business is to make something and then it has a perceived value that's higher than how much it costs you to make everything and combine it together. So we count that if it's in the same year, because once you sell it, that 40,000 will be circulated back into the economy in the form of increased production for the future or other goods and services that however they distribute that extra forty twenty five thousand dollars through their business whether it's the shareholders to buy another yacht or to uh building ramping up production for the next period of time for the next like model year that money is going to end up having a positive impact in the economy in the same year when it comes to if you sold it for less um chances are you're either making a product that nobody wants, there's a really, really bad economy and you probably shouldn't have made it to begin with or uh, you're rushing to sell it. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a good question though. I figured that no one's asked me that question. I've been waiting for someone to ask that question to be like, well, what if you sell it for less? Does that mean that the value of it is less? And the answer is no, because uh, if you sell it for less, it harms the business and the future production, but it doesn't harm or have any impact on the production that's already happened, if that makes sense. I'll do one more example um, that isn't focusing on this time of year type of scenario. So let's say that, um, Let's say that you are giving a friend a ride to work. So on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, assuming that this is normal circumstances, you get a ride from a friend or a family member or a teammate to, to, to campus. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you get a ride to campus from a friend. Tuesday, Thursday, you ride share. You take an Uber, you take a taxi cab, uh, and each time you do, it costs you $15 to Uber to cam campus. I should say ride share because I don't want to I don't want to promote a particular brand of ride sharing because they haven't paid me royalties. So ride sharing to campus. Let's say that this was a um, eight week semester. Ah, let's make it a 10 week semester makes the math easier. Well, what is the contribution to GDP in 2021 as a result of this? Well, every time you go on Tuesday, Thursday, it's $15. So 15 times two is $30. You do that 10 weeks, it's $300. 
But what about these rides? Do they count towards GDP? We can make the argument that um, we know how much the ride is worth because two out of the five times every single week that you go to campus, you're paying $15 for someone to take you there. But because of the fact that you haven't compensated the other person, it's just a favor and they're just being a good friend or a good teammate or a good family member. We don't actually get any contribution to GDP beyond what we've done through the Uber. This is known as household production. And uh, so this counts as zero, this counts as 300. So your total is $300. So it's kind of weird. One of the shortcomings of GDP is the fact that um, it we don't include things that easily could be measured based on kind of what the market value of the services, but because we're not actually paying someone to do it, it's not contributing anything to the economy in terms of circulating money and and pass and having some sort of market exchange of value in exchange for a service. So it seems like there's just a lot more rules when it comes to like the car, or the houses, like, whereas this one just seems pretty straightforward where everyone like automatically are like, oh, this is the answer because this is like, they're obviously you're not putting any money in the economy, whereas like the house, like it depends on when you buy it and when you sell it and when you put money into it. So I guess that's just a little more confusing because there's more rules. Yeah, so there's the intermediate good rule and it's tricky because sometimes something's an intermediate good. So if I renovate the house and don't sell, it's it's a final good or service. But if I renovate it and sell it in the same year, then those goods for renovation become an intermediate and then the value I sell it for is final. For this gotcha. one, you can make an argument, and this is why I said this is a shortcoming of production, is in a way by you, if you were the person giving the ride, you're doing it as a favor. And you're doing it as a favor because you're trying to save them money or you're just trying to save you money if it's reciprocated or whatever. And you can only do it Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then Tuesday, Thursday, they're on their own. But it saves them, I don't know, $45 a week. So you could make the argument that um, from a philosophical perspective that the, that the actual value of what that person is doing for you is still measurable because it's like if I if the exact same thing that I'm paying someone to do is worth $15 I'm saving $15 by not having but having to do that so that $45 a week you can make the argument is not being measured in GDP because we're not compensating each other for it. Now, it makes sense that we don't because of the fact that there's no actual economic value or economic activity in terms of the exchanging of money for services that is happening because of you doing that favor for free. So that's why we don't count it, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. So from an own personal accounting standpoint, you're saving yourself $45. So you see the benefit in that, but the government does not because there's no actual economic macro perspective that results in that actually counting. I'll do one more example. Thank I, you. No problem. I, I'll do one more example. So I think, cause I think this is the other two more examples. So the reason why I'm doing all these is because of the fact that there's a bunch of different little nuances that I want you to identify that you might miss if you kind of rush to the problem too quickly. So one of these has to do with, um, let's say that you are a server at a restaurant. Okay. So you're a server and you make your horrible $2 an hour in wages. Let's say you work 80 hours over that pay period. 
and then you collect, I don't know, $300 in tips over that, well, a week. I feel like if you're only making $300 in tips over that two week period, then you're probably going to have to have a second job and you probably would have one anyways. I don't know. But anyways, this is just for the sake of math and simplicity in math. So you're making three hundred dollars of tips in a week. Uh, one hundred and fifty of them are cash. One hundred and fifty of them are credit card. Each week. Now, as a former delivery driver who received cash tips. I can readily admit that not every single cash tip that I received, Uncle Sam knew about. Um, in fact, I don't know if any of them <laughs> Uncle Sam knew about. So, but with credit card tips, there's a paper trail. So your employer has some obligation to report it. So you can't hide all those. So um, let's say that your employer reports these but these go unreported. Well, then what's the contribution of GDP for your services over that two week period? Well, $2 an hour times 80 hours, that's $160. If you're making $300 in tips a week, well, 300 times two is 600, but wait, I don't report half of it because of the fact that um, I just collect dollar bills and I just keep them in my pocket and I don't tell my boss when they send my information to the accountant for payroll purposes that I actually made an extra $300 this pay period over what they think I made. So as a result, the actual answer is, uh, these don't count towards GDP because no one knows about it besides you. And these do. So multiply that times two, that's 300. So you end up with 300 plus 160, which is $460. So that's a contribution to GDP because this part technically counts as the underground economy. So whether it's not reporting tips whether it's not reporting um, illegal transactions of goods and services, it, call, it all gets grouped into the same category because it's concealed from the government. Therefore, the government doesn't know about the value that's being created. Because in reality, you actually created an extra $300 worth of value to the economy, but because you never reported it, we can't keep track of it. So it's just like the household production thing before where like technically there's value there and you could actually probably quantify it, but because of the fact that it's not contributing to the economy that we're, that's legal or above board or like the surface level economy, we don't count it or we are not able to because we either don't know it exists or it's illegal and we don't really want to say, hey, you know why we're not in a recession? Because we decided to, to count all of the the drug trafficking that we've said we were trying to stop as, as benefits instead of something that we're trying to keep from happening. So, um, so you won't see the government do that. And then uh, last but not least, just as a reminder, uh, net exports is equal to exports minus imports. Again, we did an example in the previous lecture where we had like the asparagus was coming from China and the wheat was being sent to Canada. So the wheat counted positively towards GDP, but the asparagus counted negatively towards GDP. And as a result, we ended up with a negative net exports value. So don't forget that if someone um, buys a good or service that's produced domestically or travels here and consumes goods and services while a guest of this country, that counts as an export. So if you go on vacation to another country 
then that will count as an import to your domestic country and an export to the foreign country that you're visiting. So let's say you, I don't know, there isn't too many places you could go over the holiday break as Americans outside of America, besides like I think Eastern Europe and maybe Mexico. So maybe you went to Mexico for break. And uh, so whatever you bought, hotel rooms, food, cervezas, everything that you consumed and purchased in Mexico will count as an import to your home country. Um, whether, so if you're American, then it would count as an import to America, um, this GDP and account as an export to Mexico's GDP. So, um, make sure that you're aware of that because some people automatically count imports as zero. So like if you go to Europe and you go see the Eiffel Tower and you go eat at a cafe, well, that stuff is counting as an import to America and an export to France. So any sort of international um, tourism transactions, tourism is going to be an import or an export based on if it's international. So if you're so if you're visiting Yellowstone or something like that, then that's domestic tourism. So it would count as a, um, so it would count as consumption in terms of GDP. But if you are not from America or you're not a resident, so like, even if you like, you don't aren't a US citizen, but you're like a resident, a legal resident of the country or you're like on a student visa or you're on like a, or if you have a green card or something like that, you would actually not count as, it wouldn't count as international tourism at that point because you probably have a, either a social security number at that point or a tax ID. So if you are kind of paying taxes as a foreign citizen uh, residing in America, then it won't count as an import or an export anymore, so. We won't get into those details. We aren't going to get into like residency status type questions for GDP, but literally like if I go to Canada and I buy uh, like a stuffed moose or something like that, like that's going to count as an import to America and an export for Canada, even though it was made in Canada and there might not be that detailed of a accounting that's happening at those stores. So um, so make sure you remember that. So those are hopefully this, the examples that will help with scenarios, both for the homework and the exam, um, because even though the definition is pretty straightforward, I think all of these little nuances are actually inherently built within the definition and the components of GDP, and they can be easy to miss if you're not hyper-focused and hyper-aware of all of those little little nuances. So with that being said, um, I wanted to turn our attention to talking about uh, real GDP. So I think it's time to get real. Um, the reality is, is that prices change over time. And the way we measure the change in prices over time is by identifying something that's known as inflation. Inflation is the increase in prices over time. When you hear about the inflation rate, the inflation rate is just a percent change in the um, inflation or in, in prices between one period of time and another period of time. So GDP is measuring value. That's by definition what GDP does. And it measures it in whatever currency that we're measuring in dollars, euros, yen, yuan, pesos, real, rand, uh, drachma, all of those currencies of the world. Um, so the thing is, though, is let's say that you are buying a pizza, okay? and you want to measure the contribution of pizza to the economy well the problem is is that pizza's price is not the same now as it was 100 years ago or 50 years ago or 10 years ago and as a result if you don't control for that price fluctuation you're going to actually overstate 
the true level of growth in your economy because of the fact that you um, were saying, oh, well, we made, let's just say you made 10 pizzas in 1916, you made 10 pizzas in 2016, and you made 10 pizzas in 2021, okay? The contribution to GDP of those 10 pizzas should be exactly the same. Doesn't that make sense? Like we produced 10 pizzas in 1916, 2016, and 2021. The economy didn't get any bigger. We made the same amount of pizzas. But the economy might be perceived to be bigger because in 1916, maybe a pizza cost like 40 cents. And in 2016, it cost $10. And now it costs $14. And so what we have to do is we need to control for that inflationary pressure. So that way we can get a more accurate estimate on whether the economy is actually growing. And if it is, by what rate is it growing at? So there are two types of GDP that um, you can measure. The first one is nominal GDP. Nominal GDP is like the simple calculation of this is how much it was worth right now. And we added up all the stuff and how much it was worth right now. And the total is our nominal GDP. Real GDP, on the other hand, is going to evaluate the same production but instead of assigning the value of how much it was worth in the moment, we're actually going to basically pick a fixed value for every good and service that's produced in the economy and basically assign that same value to each good and service no matter what year it's produced. And that's known as a base year. So we're going to evaluate goods and services at base year prices. When you hear about nominal so nominal wages, nominal prices, nominal GDP, nominal interest rates. Nominal is just whatever you see. So if you're making $14 an hour, then that means that your nominal wage is $14 an hour. Your real wage is going to be what your purchasing power based on a base year is with that $14 an hour. So if you got that $14 an hour job in 2017 and you're still making $14 an hour in 2021, then re reality and realistically, it would make sense that your actual purchasing power is less now than it was back in 2017. So yeah, I saw a question. Sorry. Um, so for that, with the real GDP, so if we are calculating the real GDP from 2001 and 2012 and the base year is 2001 we will calculate the product amounts with the price from 2001 right for real correct okay perfect thank you and then for nominal you would just do it with each respective year so 2001s would be in 01 prices 2012s would be in 2012 prices but for real what thank you're going to you. do is you're going to take the base year and just evaluate it corresponding to whatever that specific base year's prices are. With the current year's quantity as opposed to the base exactly. year's quantity, right? Exactly, okay. with the current year quantity. Because basically the definition of GDP is just the value of final goods and services. So like if we didn't take the total value, it would just be a long list of, we made 10 pizzas and 12 paper clips and 50 planes and, and four cars. And so like, if you just took the whole list year over year, like you could kind of say, oh, well, we made seven more pizzas, but two less cars. So what is actually, do we have more or less than we did before? So you could take the actual current year price and be like, well, clearly we made more in value nominally based on current year prices, but is that still more than what we made 12 years ago? I'm not sure. And so the way you do that is you take the base year as kind of like the settling point, kind of like the arbiter of the answer and say like, okay, well, pizzas existed in 2012 and they also existed in 2001. We'll pick one of these two as the base year or we'll choose some other year like 2006. They had pizzas too back then too. So let's use 2006 as our base year and then compare our quantities in 01 and 12 to 06 prices and then basically decide, you're not deciding, but you're calculating 
what real GDP in those years are, and then you can directly compare those real numbers together. You can't directly compare nominal values together because of the fact that uh, you're not accounting for inflation. It's overstating the true contribution to the economy. So just like you can make $14 an hour four years ago and $14 an hour now, but I'm pretty sure you won't be able to get as much with the $14 an hour now than you did four years ago. Some things might've become more expensive. Some things might've become less expensive, but overall inflation has gone up probably about, I don't know, eight to 10% since 2017. So um, your purchasing power, your real wage is less than it was before. And that's another topic that we'll discuss when we get to the inflation lecture. So again, a base year is a year chosen to, to provide a consistent comparison between variables over time. So what that means is that you can just actually determine how much the economy has grown. You couldn't do that before with just nominal GDP because you wouldn't be accounting for inflation. And we'll do an example that shows just by how much you would be overstating the true inflation rate as a result of not, excuse me, the true growth rate it, by not converting this to a real variable. So we don't want to mask inflation. We don't want inaccurate measurements. We want accurate measurements because you know how people like to poke holes in scientific arguments or say like this data is, is biased or inaccurate. Well, the, we have to do these conversions so that way we actually do exactly know what we're doing. Like, let's say you're running a business and you don't adjust for inflation, you might make a fatal mistake in, for your business by over uh, being over optimistic about your projections because you didn't convert to a, a measurement that accounts for inflation. So that's why we have to do these conversions. Sorry, I have another question, I apologize. You don't need to so apologize. For calculating the real GDP, can right. you pick like 2001, 2006, and 2012 and make 2006 your base year? Right. How would that, would that still calculate the same or you would use the rates that were relevant in 2006 when you're calculating real GDP for 2001? So it doesn't matter what year you choose as a base year, really. It's just a matter of making sure you're consistent when you're calculating a real variable that you're using the same base year for all. So, so consecutiveness isn't important as long as you're using the same base for everything, right? Right. Okay, perfect. So Thank you. now when the BLS or... Um, whoever does the Census Bureau and NBER, whenever they're doing these calculations for the um, choosing the base year, there are kind of two things that they're looking for. One is they want something in a year in which like there wasn't some anomaly with prices. So you don't want like, let's say 2007 or 2008 were bad, would be bad years for a base year because 07, uh, 07 through 09 just in general will be a bad choice because 07, which is ironic because the example we're about to do is assuming 2009 was a base year, but we'll ignore the, the consequences of that. But in 07, you had, and 08, particularly 08, you had this crazy surge in prices and inflation because of oil prices going up. And then subsequently in 09, you had deflation. So you don't really want to choose a year in which deflation is the subsequent year or crazy inflation is the year itself or the subsequent year because then you get like weird numbers that it won't really change anything but it'll still it'll make the calculation seem suspect if you uh have a weird number there because of inflation or deflation in the year in which you're using as the base year the second reason they'll choose a particular year typically has to do with it being recent enough where the goods and services that they're going to include in a measurement of inflation. So when we get to CPI, this will make more sense. Um, 
they want it to be recent enough where you don't have non-existent products. So like you don't want to use 1980 as a base year because like 30% of the goods and services that are going to be in a market basket in 2021 won't have existed in 1980. And maybe they're including things that don't exist now or are obsolete now. So like maybe in 94, a VCR would be part of the uh, market basket. And so, but like a Blu-ray player or streaming services or cell phones weren't part of the market basket. So you wouldn't have a good guess for what something would be valued at in that given year, if that makes sense. So choosing a good base year is usually something recent enough in which all the goods and services that you're going to be using for subsequent market baskets for price measurements in the future are the same, but also um, a year in which there wasn't significantly high inflation or deflation. But in reality, it doesn't really matter. The price, the, the product thing matters, but the actual like inflation deflation thing doesn't really matter that much because of the fact that when you normalize everything, it's all going to be based to a specific number and you're going to be, you're going to be comparing numbers that are both using the same weird calculation. So they'll all end up equally year, weird. And so you won't get any inconsistencies as a result. But anyways, to go through a problem, this might help kind of clarify any questions that anyone may have related to calculating this is Here's an example in which we have uh, an economy that is consisting of three products, party hats, pizza, and soft drinks. So in 2009, party hats were five bucks. In 2016, party hats were six bucks. In 2009 and 2016, pizza was both $10 at both points. Soft drinks were $2.09 and, and increased to $3 in 2016. We have identified for this example that the base year is 2009, which means that when we calculate real GDP for 2016 and 2009, this is the price that we will utilize. For nominal GDP, you always just utilize the price in the given year itself and multiply it times the given quantity. But for real GDP, you will use the base year price. So let's calculate nominal GDP first. The way you're gonna calculate is you're gonna multiply across the columns and then add down the rows. So multiply across the column, add down the row, multiply across the column, add down the row. So five times 100 is 500, 10 times 500 is 5,000, and then two times 1,000 is 2,000. So you should end up with 7,500 as your nominal GDP in 2009. Now, the nice thing about having a base year and you're calculating the cost of a real GDP and a nominal GDP in the base year is the answer will be the same for both because if this is the price that you're using for uh, real GDP calculations, then you're just multiplying the same numbers together and you should get 7,500 as uh, real GDP in 2009. I would write it in the slot, but my computer is not being cooperative. So if you wanna find nominal GDP, in 2016, you're going to multiply across the columns and add down the rows. So you end up with 600, 6 times 100 is 600, 10 times 550 is 5,500, and then 3 times 10, 10 is 30, 30. So when you add that together, you end up with 9,130 as your nominal GDP for 2016. Now to convert this to a real GDP, what you're going to do is you're gonna take the boxed column that I have listed here and multiply it times this box column over here. So to find 2016 real GDP, you're multiplying this box times this box 
this box times this box, this box times this box, and then adding down the rows again. So when you do that, you're going to get 5 times 100, which is 500, 10 times 550, which is 5,500. And then you're going to get 2 times 1010, which is 2020. And it turns out that when you add all that together, you get 8,020 as your real GDP for 2016. So there's the calculations without my terrible handwriting. So nominal GDP in the base year is going to be the same as real GDP in the base year because you're just doing the same calculation twice because the base year prices are the same as the current year prices. But that changes when you convert from nominal GDP in a non-base year to real GDP in a non-base year where for the first calculation, you're just multiplying the prices in the year you're measuring times the quantity in the year you're measuring. And then for real GDP, you're taking the same quantity that you had before, but you're instead multiplying it times the price in the, in the base year. So you end up with 8020 as your uh, real GDP instead of 91.30. So why is this so important? Well, usually when the NBER reports the changes in GDP between one quarter and another quarter, they report it as a percent change. So when you are estimating the growth rate between in GDP. So the growth rate in GDP is the percent change in real GDP. Now, if you're not familiar with percent change, percent change is the following. It is the new value minus the previous value or old value. I'll just say old because it's easier to say that. Divided by the old previous value times 100. This is percent change. You will use this formula for calculating the growth rate in the economy you'll use this formula for calculating the inflation rate. Basically, you'll be given some sort of number, set of numbers, and you will just plug those numbers into this formula to find percent change. Now the growth rate in GDP is actually the percent change in real GDP. If you take the percent change of nominal GDP, that will be not giving you an accurate measurement of anything because it's not adjusting for inflation and we need to adjust for inflation. So if you want to calculate the growth rate in GDP between 2009 and 2016, we're going to take 2016's real GDP list that first, which is going to be 8020. We're going to subtract the now, or excuse me, the real GDP of 2009, which is 7,500. Divide that by 7,500 and then multiply that all times 100. So you end up with 520 divided by 7,500 and then you multiply that by 100. So that ends up canceling those out. So you end up with 520 over 75 and when you calculate 520 over 75, you end up with an uh, excuse me, a growth rate of 6.93%. So that 6.93% is telling you that the economy has grown by just under 7% from 2009 to 2016. 
between 2009 and 2016. Do you round for those percentages? Like, would you round up to 7% or would you keep it as accurate as you said? I would just round to tenths or hundredths. So 6.9 or 6.93 would be acceptable. I wouldn't round all the way up to seven. In most, um, most economics, uh, people would round to per tenths of a percent. So unemployment is usually a tenth of a percent. Uh, GDP is usually a tenth of a percent. Um, so a tenth of a percent would be fine. So I go 6.9 or 6.93 for this answer. Would you be able to, or is there a second example of how to do this later on in the slides or? If is... not, I can make one. Okay. Uh, but basically, um, I'm not sure for GDP deflator if I'm doing a new example or if I'm using the same one. If I'm using the same one, then I'll make a new one. But if I'm using a different one, I'll, I'll go through with the second example how to do this. Okay, thank you. So the, the growth rate is just a percent change. You're just taking numbers that you've already calculated. It's just a matter of knowing which numbers to use. So percent change is just new minus old divided by old all times 100. So make it a percentage. Otherwise, it's just a decimal value. It's just saying what fraction of the previous value it is. So growth rate in GDP is the percent change in real GDP. The percent change in nominal GDP is nothing, but if you mistakenly use those numbers, you would get some answer around 21%, I think, or maybe even higher as the um, percent change in those numbers. But I'm not going to do that calculation because I don't want you to get into a bad habit of calculating the wrong thing. So nominal GDP is going to be useful for calculating the GDP deflator. It also helps you kind of see what the actual raw value of productivity in the country in that given year is. But whenever we're estimating how much the economy has grown, we're always converting it to a real variable. Just a rule of thumb to discuss um, the relationship between real GDP and nominal GDP. Basically, if you are measuring a year that has um, that is existing prior to the base year, then your real GDP will be higher than your nominal GDP. And the reason why is because the prices in the base year are more than the prices in the actual year itself. That won't affect your um, comparison when you're measuring growth rates, um, but it's just kind of a rule of thumb that like, if, you, if you're, like, let's say that the base year was 2012 for the previous example, we should expect that for 09 that the real GDP would actually be higher than the nominal GDP because for the most part, the prices would be higher in 2012 than they would be in 09. If you are measuring um, real GDP and nominal GDP in the base year, like the previous example we just did, you had a nominal GDP and a real GDP that were exactly the same. So for in the base year, they'll be the same. And then if you're measuring after the base year, then your nominal GDP should be higher than your real GDP, which we did get in this example because nominal GDP was 91.30 in 2016, but it was only 80.20 for real. So um, this is just a rule of thumb. So like if you're doing the calculation, you get a weird answer that doesn't match up with this rule of thumb, then maybe you did a calculation wrong. So make sure that you think about this when you finally calculate the number to make sure that at least it passes this test. Now, as I mentioned before, inflation has its kind of fingerprints all over why we're doing these calculations because again, prices always change. It would be nice if prices didn't change for the sake of simplicity and calculations but there is ramifications of us not having um, inflation or consistent price changes in the economy. That's usually a symbol or a signal of something problematic. So if we have deflation or stagnant prices, typically means that the economy isn't growing. Um, but if we do have increasing prices, 
It's usually a sign that the economy is growing, but we don't want prices to increase at rates of like 50 or 100%, because then at that point, uh, for people whose wages aren't changing very frequently, they're going to end up being significantly impacted by the fact that their purchasing power is going to drop really, really fast. So what we can do to calculate inflation, so we can take the information that we've already calculated, or we can do a new example that allows for us to measure what's known as a price level. A price level is basically going to be our way of estimating the average trajectory of prices in the economy. Because like in the previous example, pizza didn't change in price, soft drinks became more expensive, party hats became more expensive, but not everything became more expensive. Some things are cheaper, some things are more expensive. And so overall, how do we mix those together? Well, you can't because they're different products. So the way we measure it is we basically create what's known as a price level where we're taking the ratio of the average cost of a certain basket of goods and then comparing it to how much it costs in the past. And then that index, it's unitless. So there's no, per, so there's no dollars, no units. It's just a number that you can compare to another number for the sake of calculation. So it's an ordinal type of calculation, but it, it is interval in terms of its, you can take a percentage of it. But all in all, there's going to be two major price levels we talk about in this class. The first one is GDP deflator, which we're about to calculate. The second one that's more important is the consumer price index, because the consumer price index is going to be the um, measurement of average prices for average households in the economy. So it's going to look at specific products that are specific to families and what they would buy compared to GDP, with, which remembers including everything. It's including government contracts, interstate highways, excavators, um, trees. It's including everything. So I don't know how many if the average family buys a tree every year or if they buy an excavator or they buy seven miles of Interstate 80, I don't think they do that. So we don't really wanna see what the impact of those costs are um, to have a more accurate measurement of what impacts you as a household. But without further ado, we'll measure the GDP deflator. So how do we calculate it? The reason why we include this one is this one is pretty easy. Once you've already calculated nominal GDP and real GDP, all you got to do is take the ratio of the two. So remember, I told you that prior to the base year, naturally, prices are lower before the base year. So you would expect reasonably that real GDP will be higher than nominal GDP. In the base year, they're the same. After the base year, the nominal GDP is higher than real GDP. So that ratio, when you divide nominal GDP by real GDP and multiply it times 100, that is going to be your GDP deflator. Now, this will also be true for the consumer price index later on, that if you are measuring the CPI or the GDP deflator or any price level for that matter in the base year, then that means that your value for the index or the price level is going to be exactly 100. And the reason for that is because if nominal GDP is the same, your real GDP is the same, when you divide them out, you get one. If you're multiplying that times 100, then a one times 100 is going to give you 100. So, um, Keep that in mind, that's a little shortcut in terms of calculations for inflation-based problems is like, instead of having to go through the process of doing an extra calculation, if you know that the base year is 09 and I'm asking you for the CPI in 09 or the GDP deflator in 09, the answer is 100. You don't even have to do any sort of calculation because you just know that in the base year, the price level is always 100. So don't subject yourself to the risk of a typo you just automatically know it's 100. After the base year, it should naturally be greater than 100 because the ratio of this will be greater than 1 times 100. And then before the base year, it should be less than 100 
because real GDP will be higher than nominal GDP. So you end up with a decimal value. When you divide them out, that's like zero point something. It will be less than one. As I mentioned before, when you are calculating an inflation rate or any sort of percent change, you will use this formula here. Percent change is the new value minus the old value, all divided by the old value. And then you take that and you multiply it times 100. So an example of this is if we have a price level. So again, GDP deflator is an example of a price level. Consumer price index, when we talk about inflation, is going to be an example of a price level. Price level, again, is just that, that kind of accumulation of combining changing prices of different goods that aren't really related to each other and turning it into an index that allows for you to kind of measure the trajectory and the change in, in the cost of things between one period of time and another one without actually knowing the exact value of everything and without every price going up and without every price going down. They can, some can go up and some can go down, but you still are able to conclude what trajectory uh, prices change by. So if we have a price level in whatever year we're measuring, that's the new year of 110 and our old price level is 101, then what you're gonna do is you're gonna do 110, and there's a typo there, I apologize. You're gonna do 110 minus 101, which is going to give you nine over 101. How do we calculate the price level or where do we, how do we get that? So the price level is the GDP deflator for this example. So you would create, you would calculate oh, okay. this number and then you would compare those numbers in this percent change formula to find your inflation rate. Okay, thank you. No problem. Thanks for the question. So I just realized that this is all wrong. So I'm just gonna erase all this, bam. This is what happens when you try to change a number easily and then you realize that math is more complicated than just changing one number. So the actual calculation is this 110 over 101 divided by 101 times 101 is going to be or excuse me 100 sorry not 101 is going to be 9 over 101 which is going to give you about 0 0.89 I believe is the calculation that I got, um, nine divided by 101, about 0 0.089. Multiply that times 100 and you get 8.9% as your inflation rate. So that means for this example, prices are now 8.9% higher than they were in the previous period that we were measuring. So let's do an example. Um, I believe this is the same example as before. We've already calculated the growth rate in real GDP between 2009 and 2016. That was the 6.93% that we calculated before where we took uh, nine, excuse me, 8020 minus 7,500 over 7,500 times 100. And then you got 520 over 7,500 times 100. And you ended up with about um, 6.93 as the growth rate. So the answer for this is 6.93%. Now what we want to do is we want to calculate the GDP deflator for 2009 and 2016. So the GDP deflator is going to be calculated by taking the nominal GDP, dividing it by the real GDP, and then just multiplying it times 100. Now, I told you there's a shortcut. Since base year is 2009, and one of the two years in which we're estimating is 2009, 
All we got to do is just say that the answer is 100 because it's the base here. So you automatically know it's 100. For 2016, what you're going to do is you're going to take real GDP in uh, 16, which was 80-20. And then compare that to nominal GDP in 2016, which was 9130. So what you're going to do is you're going to take 9130 divided by 8020, and then multiply it times 100. And when you do that, you'll get about 113.8. So the GDP deflator in 2016 is going to be 113.8. So you get 100, you get 113.8. Now to calculate the inflation rate, all you're gonna do is gonna take the percent change between your two GDP deflators. So when you do that, you're going to take the new GDP deflator of 2016, which is 113.8 minus 100, because that was the GDP deflator in 09. Divide that by the previous GDP deflator, which is 100. Multiply that times 100. That cancels, you're left with 13.8% as your inflation rate. So here is the calculation for the growth rate. The first problem that we did, where basically you're taking the real or you're, you're taking the comparison of real GDPs of 016 and 09 80 20 minus 7500 is 520 divided by 7500 that ratio gives you about 0 0.693 multiply that times 100 you get 6.93 percent growth so that's telling you how much the economy grew between 2009 and 2016. If you want to calculate the GDP deflator, well, for 2009, the GDP deflator is really simple. You don't even need to do a calculation, but just for the sake of explaining why you wouldn't need a calculation, real GDP and nominal GDP are the same in 09, so these cancel out, and you're left with 1 times 100, and you get 100 for your GDP deflator for 2009. To calculate the GDP deflator for 2016, then you plug in the nominal GDP of 9130, divide that by 8020. That ratio gives you about 1.1348. Multiply that times 100, and you get about 113.48 as your GDP deflator for 2016. And then when you want to calculate the inflation rate between the two years, you're just going to take the new GDP deflator of 113.48 minus the GDP deflator of 09, which is 100. Since 09 is the previous value, put that in the denominator, and you end up with 13.48 over 100, 0.1348 times 100. Inflation rate is 13.48%. So percent change is just the same every time. It's the new value, like the thing that's closer to now in terms of time, minus the previous value, which is the furthest thing away from now in terms of time. Take that difference, divide it by the, the old value, the previous value. Take that quotient, multiply it times 100, and then that'll give you the percent change between those two time periods based on the metric that you're measuring. 
So if you're measuring price levels like GDP deflator or CPI, then your inflation rate will be a uh, will be measured by that. So anything, if it's a percent change in a price level, you're measuring inflation. You're measuring the change in prices between those two years. If you are taking percent change of real GDP, like you were in this example, then what you're measuring is the growth rate. The growth rate is how much bigger or smaller is the economy in terms of its production value between now and the previous time period. So in this example, it's saying that the economy is about 7% bigger than it was back in uh, 2009. So there, <clears throat> excuse me, there's a bunch of different price levels. Uh, GDP deflator is an example of one. The reason why we don't include GDP deflator in our inflation specific lecture is because of the fact that um, it includes everything. And as I mentioned before, you want to make sure that you are limiting your, um, your measurement of changes in prices to things that are going to be relevant to the population in which you're assessing. So GDP deflator might actually include things that we don't want to include, like steel beams and cars and highway and excavators and things like that. And that doesn't mean that they don't personally impact you and you might be interested in those prices, but if you wanna take an estimation of how much more expensive things are for the average family, you wanna look at things like rent and food and gasoline and clothes and things, education, healthcare, things that basically everyone needs, wants, or purchases and seeing how much that changes over time. Another example of a price a level, again, there's a bunch of different examples that you can have. The producer price index is a price index that measures the changes in prices of goods purchased by producers. So what that means is that basically um, this is going to include goods and services that are typically purchased by like construction workers and manufacturers. So the excavator and the steel beams and the physical plants and all those things that the typical person doesn't think about or has any interest in thinking about, that's what's going to be included in the producer price index. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this up, even though we're not doing any calculations related to it, is that in economics, we have a lot of things that are known as indicators. So you might have heard of the term a canary in a coal mine. Basically, the term of art is that basically canaries were susceptible to like a, a gas in the coal mine that would be uh, that could cause explosions or suffocate the miners. So basically, you would take a canary in there. And if the canary starts getting ill or dies, then that means you need to get out because of the fact that something bad is about to happen. So economists are no different. We have indicators. Some are known as leading indicators. A leading indicator basically says that look out for this impacting the regular economy in three to six months. So if you see that firms that are producing and manufacturing new homes, manufacturing cars, manufacturing a lot of important consumer goods are seeing a significant uptick and how much they're paying to acquire the raw materials that they need to produce the good or service. Well, typically there's three to six months of lead time in producing a lot of these big ticket items and significant consumer goods. So basically when you see an uptick in the producer price index in terms of how much prices are going up, it's a leading indicator to let you know as an economist or as a citizen that basically three to six months from now, you should reasonably expect that your personal cost of living is going to go up because that cost is going to be passed through to you in some way, shape, or form. Not all of it, 
but some of it will. And so there's a chance that if you see a PPI going up, that that's a leading indicator that prices in the CPI will go up three to six months later. We also have what are known as lagging indicators. And so lagging indicators are basically there to confirm something that already exists. So I don't know if you are into memes or not, but I don't know, eight years ago was kind of like when memes started exploding. Now it's basically the, there was like certain templates for memes and they keep coming and going and changing and evolving, but kind of like eight to 10 years ago was like the big heyday of memes where basically like there was a specific like 12 set of templates and everyone followed that and fit that trope. And then that was what they shared. Nowadays, memes are just basically viral jokes through a visual medium that may or may not follow a particular convention other than they're trying to make some of some fun of some sort of common theme, but oftentimes it's probably not actually accurate or funny. So uh, it may not be a good meme, but anyways, there was this one meme and it was like a pink like background and it was a picture of Slowpoke, which is a Pokemon. And so the joke for Slowpoke was always that like he would tell you something that was significant about the world like way after it happened. So like a Slowpoke meme of right now would be like, hey, did you hear about this coronavirus? Like everyone knows that it's happened. Everyone knows that it has existed because it's permeated every aspect of our lives in terms of taking our lives, making us ill, taking, affecting our jobs and livelihood because of shutdowns or because of economic consequences of it. Um, it's strained our healthcare system. It's changed our education system. So um, it's obvious that it's happened and it's there, but um, basically it's there to confirm that something existed. So lagging indicators do have a usefulness be besides being kind of like a check to say, yeah, I guess it was really a recession. Um, but basically they're economic indicators that happen like way after the fact that like, okay, three to six months of a leading indicator, the PPI was the CPI is kind of the current, what is the kind of what is the kind of cost that the average family is doing within the moment? You might have a lagging indicator that might basically um, be a backstop to indicate that maybe the um, that the worst is over. So basically, like maybe you know that three months after um, it like increased prices affect CPI, it might affect this other indicator. And then basically, if you know there's a three month window between it impacting that and that, once it stops or once it slows down, that can be an indicator to confirm that maybe the worst is behind or maybe that the significant event is kind of ending. So lagging indicators are there not only to help with recursive models and try to allow for discounting factors for very sophisticated forecasting models, but they are also there to try and kind of confirm and uh, confirm what's already happened or to make a prediction as to when what's currently happening might uh, come to a conclusion. So um, price levels, this is kind of your experience of indicators. Okay, so like maybe it's a warning sim signal, maybe it's just giving us a current kind of cross section or bird's eye view of what's going on right now, or you might have a lagging indicator that tells you, okay, a few months from now, we're going to see this impacted and maybe we know that it's finally kind of ending, that maybe the impacts of the recession are starting to mitigate to the point where we can kind of get back to some semblance of normalcy. But in terms oh, of price I levels, oh, go ahead and ask a question. Sorry. So talking about like the lagging indicators. Mm -hmm. So when we were talking about recessions, how they have historically happened for quite some time, although the, the time space in between them has varied, we, our economy has regularly gone through varying levels of recession. Right. So with the lagging indicators, 
why aren't those used by economists to see what is being done incorrectly in the economy to help prevent recessions in the future? So um, that's a good question. Um, my short answer for you is that economists do use it. It's just that people don't necessarily listen to us because the reality is, is that um, one of the biggest critiques, as we'll talk about with unemployment, is like everyone says that unemployment is understated or just because you have a job doesn't mean that are you are you have a good job and all this other stuff and the reality is is that economists by nature are collecting this data and reporting this data it's just that when it comes to how you disseminate and receive your information whether it's through a newspaper or a website or social media um as someone that may not have the economic training you're just going to kind of see the big the big number and the big picture and you're just going to kind of some are just going to take it as face value and some are going to be like well i'm just not going to listen to it because it's biased and it's missing all these key things but what you'll end up learning is that all these indicators exist and a lot of people have to go through great lengths of doing sampling and research projects to actually make these indicators generally known to the public or available and so the there's actually something that's known as there's a couple of things there's the congressional budget office the cpo which actually basically goes through and has to do an accounting of every single bill that involves the budget and it basically makes a recommendation to congress as to what the economic impacts of this bill is going to have so whether it's so back in 2017 the CBO reported that the tax cuts that were passed would cause a $1.5 trillion hole in the budget moving forward over the next five to 10 years in terms of our deficit and our national debt. Uh, some people who are fiscally conservative think that's a huge problem, uh, but Congress still passed it anyways. Um, so the people that are clamoring for student loan debt cancellation now are saying, oh, well, we can't afford it now, but the reality is, is the amount of student loan debt that exists out there is $1.5 trillion. So if you're going to blow a $1.5 trillion hole in the budget, why didn't you just cancel every, every student's student loan debt instead of giving tax cuts that only benefited, I don't know, marginally benefited you $200? Um, and then yours isn't permanent either. It's going to end up, um, it ends up getting expired after 2021. And then it goes back up unless it's renewed or Cong the new Congress comes in and changes those tax laws. So they're always doing this analysis. Furthermore, there's also what's known as the Council of Economic Advisors, which is basically PhD economists that uh, counsel the president on um, economic issues related to things. Furthermore, you have the Federal Reserve System. So the Federal Reserve System, even though it's the Central Bank of the United States, has 12 district banks and its main headquarters in DC, which means you have 13 institutions and basically the people that are hired at those institutions are PhD economists who basically do a bunch of research and reports based on the current economic conditions in the economy. So the reality is, is that we have all this information. Some of it is a problem of messaging. Like it's hard to break down something this complicated into kind of like a, like a, like a catchphrase or like something that's easily digestible by 330 million Americans. So like, think about, uh, Think about all the people that have never taken this class and never will take this class and won't be able to kind of understand what I'm teaching you. And not because they can't, but because they don't have the training to figure that out. Furthermore, there's still gonna be people in this class who pass the class and still won't remember what I just said. And, 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 and not just today, but in terms of future indicators and using the Federal Reserve Economic Database, um, all of these kind of little tools 
that allow for you to be able to find this information and see like how do we um how do we affect policy to try and mitigate recessions or to get out of them so some of them are automatically built into the system and then the last portion of this course is entirely about economic policy where you're taking this information and you're enacting policy around it to try and stop a recession or to slow down a recession or to prevent a recession from occurring. So all of this stuff is happening. All of this stuff has always happened, no matter who is the president, no matter uh, what status the economy is in. It's just a matter of who's listening to us and when they listen to it, are they actually hearing us and are they actually taking our advice or wisdom and people disagree or agree on things so it's not to say that everything that i say or what i teach in this class or what some economist finds in a journal article is perfect or or um or the right answer it's just that it's been vetted pretty well so that way if someone wanted to use that for their own analysis or the government wanted to use it it's there okay Thank you. Does that help explain some things? Yes, it does. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Does anybody have any other questions? <laughs>